Good morning, everybody. My name is Noah Newman. I'm with No-Till Farmer and Strip-Till Farmer. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar with Precision Planting on Planter Maintenance, the Foundation for a Successful Season. Clay Scott is going to be our presenter today, and he's going to give us tips for making sure the planter doesn't hold you back this spring. The Ohio State graduate is a member of the product support team at Precision Planning. He recently moved to Central Illinois from Northeast Ohio, where I'm actually also from, so what a coincidence that is. He grew up on his family's farm raising show pigs in Northeast Ohio. Before joining Precision Planning, Clay spent time as a technician at an Agco dealership working on Fint tractors. When he's not helping you set up your planner, he enjoys pulling and boating with family and friends. So before we get started, I want to let you know there is a control panel with a Q&A icon you probably see on the bottom of your screen. Type in your questions there during the presentation and Clay will do his best to answer them as the presentation goes along. We're also recording today's session in the event you want to go back and watch it or share it with anyone. So without further ado, take it away, Clay. Thanks, Noah. Like Noah said, my name is Clay Scott. I'm on the product support team here at Precision Planting. And uh, I just wanted to, to say thank you to you guys as no-till farmers for joining today. Uh, it's really great to have you guys here and share some of the knowledge that we've found here at Precision Planting. And we've seen in our research, we can, we can share that knowledge with you and help you guys have better yields. So Noah gave, me, gave you guys a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up in, center, in Northeast Ohio, um, spent some time at Ohio State going through agricultural systems management, really enjoyed my time there. Got to do some research uh, in Worcester at the OARDC. And yeah, about a year ago, moved out here to central Illinois, the, uh, the flatlands, as I like to joke with friends back home, because this is nothing like Northeast Ohio, but it's been really good. I uh, really enjoy the people out here at Precision Planting, and, and we get to do a lot of fun stuff uh, with farmers like yourself. So as Noah mentioned also, uh, there's a place for you guys uh, to put questions in. If you guys have questions, drop them in there. Uh, Joel or Micah can, can you, get you guys uh, get those questions relayed to me and I can get those answered, um, pending I know the answer. If not, um, we, we do have our product support line and you can call in and we can work through some of those issues. And we also have uh, precisionplanning.com forward slash maintenance. You can go on there and you can see our maintenance guides and our recommendations and a checklist. So as you guys are going through this stuff at home this winter, um, you can go through and kind of check those boxes off as you work across the planner. So again, I want to thank Joel and Micah for being here. You guys have been great with getting all this set up. They've done a really nice job. Um, we've already had a lot of compliments on that. So uh, thanks to you guys. So planner maintenance, why should you care? Well, it affects a lot of things. It affects depth. It affects emergence. It affects spacing, singulation, and ultimately yield. So Let's dive into some economics and see why you should care about any of this. So we're gonna go over here to the whiteboard and I'm gonna go through a couple things. Uh, so we're shooting for uniformity, right? So when we're, when we're talking about planter maintenance, that's what, we're, that's what we're after. We're trying to have a uniform stand. We're gonna we want that picket fence stand that we always talk about. You know, you think about our logo from, from years back, it was the picket fence stand. So that's something that we've really been passionate about here at Precision Planting. Um, through, through different things and something that you guys should also be passionate about because it drives yield. So this planner maintenance session applies to anyone. This is whether you've got the latest and greatest uh, technology from, from your manufacturer of choice or if you're running an older planner that you've kind of kept up with and just using chain drives and finger meters. All of this still applies to you. Um, all of this is, is really important stuff and, and the yield potential is nearly the same when we're talking about the difference, I guess. Um, so that wasn't a good way to say that. How can I make that more clear? Um, if you have a 7,000 with finger meters and you have a high speed planner, you're gonna take percentage wise about the same hit if you let planner maintenance fall behind. So we need to keep planner maintenance in check. That way we can drive those yields as high as our, our machines, our hybrids and our fertility is gonna let us. So if we have, one plant every 17 and a half feet. So one plant every 17 and a half feet. That's one plant every one one thousandth of an acre. So in one acre, we'll have a thousand plants that have this damage. Now, if we have one of those every 17 and a half feet, that's one leaf collar behind. That is 
a half an ear loss on that plant, which equals a three and a half bushel per acre loss. So one leaf collar behind, half an ear loss, it's three and a half bushels to the acre. So that's pretty significant. We start adding up a lot of these issues. You know, maybe you have one of these on every row. And now you've got, you know, a significant amount of plants in the field that are damaged. So let's put some numbers to this because planter maintenance is expensive. We all know that. Every time we go to the parts store, it hurts. You know, our family is the same way. We're buying the same parts as you guys are, and, and it's tough. We have to think about, you know, where can we spend our best dollars when we're going over planter maintenance? So three and a half bushel loss on $6 corn is $2,100 on 100 row acres. So what's 100 row acres? So you've got an eight row planter. You plant 800 acres a year with that planter. That's 100 row acres. Each row on that planter planted 100 acres. So if we tie this one plant every 17 and a half feet to one, one row, basically, and put that across 100 row acres, that's $2,100 that you lost because of that one row. So now we're talking about maintenance parts. We, you know, we already mentioned that they're expensive. It's, it's a painful trip to the, to the dealership each time about $250 a row. So I figured that I, I just got on johndeere.com and just looked up some parts for a, for a standard max merge XP row unit. Um, so take these numbers somewhat with a grain of salt because I don't know what your dealer is charging and I don't know what planner you have, but these are fairly standard numbers, um, about $250 a row. So that was new disc openers, new seed tube guard, uh, new parallel arm bushings, new mustache and new shoulder bolt. So we'll go through all those components will become a lot more a lot more aware of those as we go through the, the demonstration today, but it's about $250 a row. So when we're looking at these one plant every 17 and a half feet, and we're looking at these plants that are one leaf collar behind, we need to think about, was this a maintenance issue or was, was this a management issue? And so that's something that we have to start the year off fresh. We need to eliminate variables. So as we talked about earlier, I'm in product support. And one thing that we're, we try to do is we try to eliminate all the variables. We wanna get down to one component and we wanna see what's happening on that one component. And then we'll add things back in to see how it affects others. But we need to get it whittled down to one component. So how we can do that is by doing planter maintenance. So now if we have a plant issue, we know that it was a management thing because we did our planter maintenance. So the first thing I wanna get into is leveling your hitch, leveling the bar. So when, when we get to the field, that's First day, that's what we want to start off with is making sure the bar is level. And I want to really encourage you guys, day one in the field is not a race. We don't care how many acres we get. I want you, I want you to really encourage you to think about the first day in the field as a write-off. We're just going out. We're going to do a little planting. We're going to get everything tuned in. Who cares how many acres we get? Let's just pick the first nice day in May. I know we're getting angsty. We want to go, 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 go but we just need to step back, take the day, make sure everything's right. And then you're done. We want to dig every once in a while as we go through, but if we spend that one day at the beginning to get everything right, then we're done. We can do a little bit of digging and, and roll. So uh, we're going to start off with going up here to the front. And when we're talking about trying to get the bar level, we want to take a level and put it right here on the bar. So when we've got that, we need to make sure that this bar is level to the ground because that'll tip that row unit forward or back. And I know you guys are no-tillers, so a lot of you still have a no-till colder out front. So what happens whenever I tip this row unit like, like it is here? If this thing's angled down like this, what happens? That no-till colder is now deeper than it should be, and it's gonna be creating, creating a false bottom. So if we're running that, uh, that no-till colder at you know, three quarters of an inch above planting depth so we'll say an inch and a quarter deep and this thing tips down we could be creating a false bottom and it's especially more important 
if you're running a tighter tolerance from the bottom of your no-till colder to the bottom of your uh, or to your depth um, to the bottom of your disc openers. So how can we fix that? First thing we're going to start off with is the hitch of the tractor. So we're going to come up here on this particular planter. We've got a clevis and we've got different bolt holes. So we can adjust where our clevis actually is to raise or lower the tongue of the planter. Now, what if you have a two-point planter? You've got, you know, you've got a two-point style. First thing we want to do is turn draft off. We want that thing, we want it 100% in position. We don't want that thing moving up and down because that can cause a lot of issues and you won't even catch it because that thing's back there moving around. And if you're not watching specifically the hitch, you'll never catch it. So we need to move our clevis. We need to move our, our two-point arms up and down. If you have a clevis style uh, hitch on the planter and you still can't get enough, a lot of tractors have a dropped draw bar. You can also flip that to get even more height, but most cases, this is gonna be good enough. Um, but check with your manufacturer of the tractor before you flip that, because I know there are some nuances to that. So now we've set our hitch and we've got it pretty much level out here um, at the bar. So how can we, how can we validate? How can we verify? Cause that's something that we really need to do. So first day in the field, remember it's not a race. We're just out there to, we're just out there to, uh, get things going, get things tuned in. And so while this thing is going through the field, we wanna make sure that our parallel arms are level. And so what we're doing there is we wanna set this down in the ground, have one of the farm hands come with you and just walk alongside the planter. And we wanna make sure that these parallel arms are, are totally straight with the bar. We want everything to be level because we can change the height of the bar to, to get some of that out, but we need the bar to be level right so um again when we're looking at this stuff we need to make sure that we're not getting these parallel arms at too much of an angle uh, because we can we can have depth issues and things like that as we're going through so when we're talking about bar leveling we've got a no-till colder out here on the front we've got row cleaners we've got our keaton seed firmers in a lot of cases and we've got our closing system so what does an improper uh, leveling job look like. We'd already talked about our no-till colder being too deep, creating a false bottom. So now we've got an air pocket around the bottom of that seed and that's gonna lead to emergence issues. We've got row cleaners. Now, if we're using a floating style row cleaner, uh, we can get around a lot of those issues because it's gonna move up and down. If you have a pin style row cleaner, this can cause some serious issues. Because what will happen is if you get into any sort of terrain, those, those row cleaners are just going to dig in and create a valley. And what happens in the first rain? That valley fills up with water, and when it dries out, that could crust, and now we're going to have even more emergence issues. And then we're out with the, with the rotary hoe trying to, trying to get this stuff out of the ground, and that's never a good day. So, yep. The question is, So the question was, uh, do we level with the planter in the ground or lifted? We always wanna level with the planter in the ground. Um, so again, first day in the field when, when we're not trying, to, not trying to win the race, drop that in the ground, we can look at our parallel arms and then we can, we can throw the level on the bar while it's in the ground. Yep, that's a great question, sorry I missed that. So another thing about leveling the bar, we, we talked about our Keaton seed firmers, which we don't have one on here, but I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of what a Keaton seed firmer looks like. Then we've got our closing system. So as that row unit tips with the back end up, now our Keaton doesn't have the 20, uh, 20 ounces of tension that we call for um, it, from precision planning. That's, that's what our recommendation is that Keaton has 20 ounces of tension pushing down. And also our closing system could be maxing out. If it's rotated up too much, our closing system could be not, act, not putting adequate down pressure um, to close that trench. And again, we're gonna lead to emergence issues. So as I'm sure you figured out already, we're really big on emergence here at Precision Planting. We feel that it's absolutely critical to yield that we have even emergence. So all of this stuff is gonna be tied back to emergence and how we can improve and uh, create more uniform, uniform emergence. So that being said, we need to talk about ballast and how we can keep, we can do all the bar leveling in the world, but we need to be able to keep this bar in the ground. 
So if you're, if you're out there on the first day and you're going through some things and you've leveled the bar, but as soon as you start going, these parallel arms out here, they're angled down, but the ones in the center are flat. Well, your bar's starting to smile at you. And so what causes that is on a, a box planter like this, you're probably not gonna see it very much, but on something like a central fill planter, uh, we can see the bar start to smile because there's not much weight out here on the wings. So what can we do? We can put like ready rod in here or rebar or concrete or flat bar, anything we need to put more weight out here in this bar to keep that thing in the ground. Um, and, and we'll get into some more issues with not having enough bar weight here later on. But if the bar is starting to smile and you've got parallel arms angled down out here and straight in the middle, you've probably got bar float happening. So a lot of us are pulling our markers off. We've got GPS. We, we paid the precision ag guy at the dealership. How many thousands of dollars? We got rid of all those markers. We don't need that stuff. We've got RTK nowadays. Those markers were weight. And I'm, pull, I'm a fan of pulling markers off. Don't get me wrong. I'm a fan of pulling markers off. But we have to think about when we pull that off, we need to replace that weight with something because we probably needed it. So we can put fertilizer tanks out here. We can fill them with water. That way they're just there, just providing some weight. Um, I know a lot of companies make suitcase weight kits and we can hang some suitcase weights. Looks like we got another question. Yep. So where should the depth of your no-till colder be? Always above planting depth. So we'll get into this later uh, as, far as, as far as the true depth, but you always want that to be above planting depth. Um, whether that's you're planting to, you know, a standard two inches. I'm, I'm an advocate of being over or shallower than an inch and a half, just because you, know, you, can, get, you can get too close and you get into some terrain type stuff and we can cause some issues. Um, we absolutely do not want a false bottom in that trench. So keep those no-till colders up. Um, and I'm going to have some, some shocking stuff here later on that we might not even have to apply there. So the last thing as far as leveling the bar and things like that is checking your tire inflation. And it's something that I think we overlook. We just pull a planter out and pull it over the shop. Load this thing up and make sure that you've got adequate inflation in the tires because if they're squatting or the planter's leaning you know we can cause some issues there as far as side to side variability now in a lot of cases like on a kinsey we're going to want that axle in the top bolt hole so um, just one thing that we've ran into and i'm not saying that's a blanket statement to cover everyone but a lot of a lot of guys have have moved to that and that's where we're seeing a lot of guys at so moving on um, as long as we don't have any questions, Joel, still good? Okay. So I wanted to really dive in. We're going to start going over true planner maintenance and, and the parts and the pieces of what goes into a row unit. So let's start with parallel arms. So we've got a, got a worn parallel arm here. Uh, this one's really not too bad. Um, on this one here, this was just one that we ran for about a year. Um, and the bushings are not too worn out. We've got a little bit of slop here but it's really not too bad. I mean, I can wobble them back and forth. And, and most of the time guys are gonna say, no, I'm not replacing that. I wanna encourage you to look really, really hard at your parallel arms. Um, I'm good, okay, sorry. So I want you to look every year at parallel arms and look at the back of the row unit. So if we go over here, we've got, we've got an older style XP row unit over here. And if you look, when I pick this thing up, I've got three quarters to an inch, somewhere in there of slop. Now, what, what can happen if we have that slop? Well, even if we go out and level the bar the first day in the field and that row unit has slop in the gauge or in the parallel arms, that row unit can still tip down. And again, we're putting our no-till quarter too deep. We've got inadequate pressure on the Keaton, inadequate pressure on the closing. So check your parallel arms. I don't, I, I don't know, can you guys see this on the screen? See the, the slop there? These really aren't that bad. But the question with planner maintenance that we always go back to is, is it gonna get me through the year? Whether that's parallel arms, whether that's disc openers, whatever the case is, is it gonna get me through the year? We need to make sure that we've got enough life left in that component to make it all the way through. 
That's something we really we just really have to keep in mind. Now, there's a lot of good kits out there to repair parallel arms. Um, you know, places like SI has a bushing kit where you ream it out and put a new piece in. Uh, there's a company in Ohio, GBGI. They make a, a two-piece bushing. Um, pr shameless plug. Precision Planning recently came out with our own uh, parallel arms, the DuraWare kit. Uh, so there's a lot of different options to to repair and replace your parallel arms. Yeah, yeah, we can go back over here. So on this row, if we lift, we've got about three quarters to an inch of up and down movement. And, we'll, and remember what we were saying, we can tip that row unit forward or back and we can get some, some depth issues with that. The other thing with parallel arms being worn is that causes chatter. So if we think about, as this is going across the field, and that thing's bouncing like that, what's your meter doing? The meter's shaking all over the place. So it, we can have uh, singulation issues, we can have spacing issues. As that's bouncing across the field, it could struggle to pick seeds up out of the seed pool and pull those off. Um, you know, you could shake a finger meter loose. You could shake seeds out of the, from behind the fingers. As that seed's traveling down the seed tube, it's ricocheting even more now because that, that row unit is bouncing so much. So having good parallel arm planter maintenance is absolutely critical. Um, it's, it's really just, it's, it's really critical. I can't stress this one enough, guys. So as we're moving on, we want to talk about depth. And what controls depth? So we've got our parallel arms because if the parallel arms are angled down, we're never gonna get to depth because they're maxed out, they're against the stop. So we need to have level parallel arms. Um, we've got our, our depth adjustment here. This is the one that everybody thinks of. We've got depth adjustment, but what else plays into that? We've got our gauge wheel arms. We've got our gauge wheels themselves. Uh, and those are, those are going to be the two main things. But then we've also got what we call the mustache, which if we go over to this John Deere row unit, you can see this, this little mustache is here, and this is on the depth handle. So as we move that depth handle up and down, it moves the mustache up and down, and those gauge wheel arms come up and contact that mustache. So. Why should we care about depth? Well, we need to be planning into moisture and we need to have heat. Those are the two most important things to get a crop out of the ground and all the way through the growing season. So if we're planting too shallow, we can be out of moisture and be in a lot of heat. And if we're too deep, we can be into a lot of moisture and not enough heat. So we need to be mindful about, about depth as we're, as we're planting. So, the biggest contributor, however, to depth is actually your disc openers. This is the first part and the most important. So you've heard this for the past, I don't know how many years, but the first thing to check is, are our opening discs big enough? So this one is about 14 and 5 eighths. I'm gonna tell you that this disc is junk. So you're gonna say, well, Clay, Precision Planning recommends that we change a John Deere disc at 14 and a half. And you'd be right. However, is this gonna get you through the season? If you only put 30 row acres on a year into some you know, heavy conventional tilled ground or some light conventional tilled ground, this will probably get you by. But if you're doing 100 row acres into some heavy no-till ground with no colder, this, this is junk. This is not gonna get you through a full year. So these are management decisions that we have to make right now that are gonna affect our crop for, the fall, for this following year. Um, this is just as important as your fertilizer, you know, your fertilizer choices and your fertilizer, fertilizer inputs. I know that's something that's been heavy in a lot of our minds as of late. And, and this is really just, import, just as important. So I'm gonna write on the board what we have as far as uh, planter maintenance on disc openers. So John Deere and Kinsey are 
15 inches new. And at 14 and a half, they are junk. A Case 2000 is 14 new. And 13 and a half, it has seen its usable life. So now a case 1200 is 15 and 14 and a half. A white or an agco or a precision planning ready row unit is six. This would be a 9,000 series is 16 inches new and 15 and a half. And a white 8,000 is 15 new and 14 when it's seen its usable life. So we're really only dealing with a half inch of wear around that blade. Um, so the question always comes up, whether it's uh, a grower or a dealer, how many acres can I put on a set of disc openers? We can't give a recommendation on that. So every disc opener is gonna wear differently in your scenario. So if you, like I said, if you're into a, a heavy no-till, you know, with maybe some, some rocks or something and you're gonna have some, some bends in the blade or stuff like that at the end of the year, you probably need to look at replacing every year. If you're planning into cotton candy, basically, you're gonna get a couple of years out of them, but it's all about this measurement. There should never be an acre amount tied to this unless you have done research on your farm, seeing how long they last at your place, then you can kind of tie some acres to it, but it all comes back to this measurement. So this could be every year for a lot of guys. Um, I really encourage you to go out when we get done here, go out and pull one off the planter, see where it's at. Then you've got somewhere to go. You can either say, okay, I can put this one back on. I'm good. Or, hey, I need to go down to the dealership. I need to get some blades and put these on. So when you're replacing blades, there's you know a couple of different uh, thicknesses of the blade that you can get. So we've got like a three millimeter blade. This is, a, this is the thickness of the blade. And, and the dealer will tell you when you're buying these how thick they are. It's not like you have to go out and measure. It's a good idea too if you, if you have something now and you're adjusting shimming, but when you're buying them new, not such a big deal. So we've got a three millimeter blade, a three and a half, and then there is a four. So when you go to the dealership and you're buying new disc openers and the parts guy says, hey, we've got these brand new heavy duty disc openers. You want to set? Ask him how thick they actually are. Because a lot of times heavy duty just means thicker. And what can happen with something like a four millimeter disc is that it'll actually dull out quicker. So again, if you're planting into cotton candy, it's probably not such a big deal. But if you're in heavy no-till ground, you need the, the edge of that disc to be sharp so you can actually penetrate and get to depth. So be careful about heavy duty disc. You wanna see how, how thick they actually are and, and make that decision um, when the time comes. So also be mindful of shimming. You have to know how thick these discs are to shim them properly. So I'm gonna erase a couple things here. So a three millimeter blade needs to be two to two and a half inches when we shim. And we'll, we'll show you what this is, but I just want to get these out here in case somebody wants to write them down. Three and a half millimeter blade is inch and a half to two inches. And a four millimeter is around one inch. So let's talk about what those numbers mean. So that is the amount of contact on those disc openers whenever we check the shimming. So there's, there's shims behind your disc openers and we can set the, basically set the gap of how close or how far apart those discs are from each other. So I'm gonna grab another business card and then Micah and my, actually let's Micah, let's go over to this one over here. This might be a little bit easier to see. 
So we've got two standard business cards. And these ones are actually uh, ones from Precision Planting that come with uh, all these measurements on there and as well as kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, guide to get you through disc shimming. So we start with one business card in the top. We come up with one in the bottom. They're kind of tricky. Sometimes they like to fall out. But then we're actually going to measure this distance from here to here from where that business card goes in to that one. And I'm actually gonna step over and grab a tape measure quick, and then we can uh, measure this and see how our shimming actually is. So if I measure this and I start, we're at about two and a half. So if these are a three millimeter blade, we're in check. We're at the high end of the range, but we're in check. But if these are any thicker than a three millimeter blade, we need to probably pull a shim or two out, tighten that up and get a little bit more contact point. So one thing I want you, I want you to check, when you go to check shimming, we just did here, let's just spin that around. Let's come over here to a different point. Throw those business cards back in. Let's check it here. So we've got two and a half again. The reason I like to do that is because a lot of times, even on a brand new blade, we can get warps. We can get warps in the blade. And then after we've ran it for a while, again, if we hit rocks or anything like that, we can actually warp those blades even more. So I really encourage you to spin those discs as you're checking shimming and check it in a couple places. Now, when you go to replace discs, I want you to take a brand new disc. You just got it from the dealership. You just, you just got back to the shop, you're gonna get started. Take each disc before you put it on, and I want you to put a bolt in the vise, okay? So you put a bolt in the vise, and I want you to put this disc on there, I want you to spin it. And what that's gonna check is it's gonna check run out this way, so if it's, if it's not round, it's gonna go up and down, or if the hub's not in the center, and then it's also gonna check run out this way of if that disc is already warped. Now, I don't have a recommendation on what's considered scrap versus good. I really honestly don't. Um, it's more so a matter of if you can get it shimmed to the proper spec, then it's good or then, then it's not. Um, but I, I encourage you to check that. And I also encourage you to buy a couple extra while you're there. Buy three extra ones. You can always return them. But I bet you'll find that you'll find a couple that are, that are damaged. Question? That that is Agco's recommendation. I do. Yep. Okay. So question came in of why is the Agco eight thousand um, a different recommendation? We can run that one an inch versus uh, versus half an inch with everyone else. I don't know the the logic behind that, but I do know that's Agco's recommendation uh, for their disc openers. Now I will point out that on an exact emerge, they do recommend. Uh, John Deere does recommend going a full inch. Um, what we found is it's similar geometry, and so we are still sticking with uh, 14 and a half. But it's all about who you ask these days, I guess. So we've, che we've checked our disc openers. We've decided that we needed to replace them. We got new ones. We checked those on the vise when we get home. Now we're ready to put them on. We've shimmed them. We're good to go. So what is the next thing controlling depth? It's our gauge wheels. So we've got two different two different styles of gauge wheel here. We've got a, a case style. So this is what we call an RID wheel. So you can see that this has a, a rib and it's got a reduced inner diameter. That's why it's called an RID wheel. And the reason for this is the way that a case row unit makes the trench and makes the seed trench and makes furrow, they don't need pressure right beside the trench where like every, I mean, every other row unit on the market does. So the way that they form their, the way that they form their trench is they've got this seed boot and they've got this furrow forming point gauge. So, or furrow forming point, sorry, I was looking at my gauge here. So what happens is as those disc openers create a trench, this firming point actually comes through and presses down and creates the bottom of that furrow, whereas a V-style opener like on a Deer or an Agco or a Kinsey, 
is going to be what's actually creating the bottom of that trench. So if you have a case planner, when, if you don't have one of these gauges, we get done here, run down to the case dealership. I don't want you to leave right now. I want to keep talking to you. But as soon as we get done, run down to the case dealership and get you one of these. So what we can actually do is we can take this firming point, and you see it's got a little triangle there. We can take and put that firming point into there, and there's a little small sight gauge, and we can see if this firming point needs replaced or not. So this is a really important part of a case row unit. Uh, we need to be checking this often. They also have their seed shoe. So this is traveling through the ground uh, with, the furrow, with the furrow forming point in front of it. And this is actually holding the seed trench open as it's going across the field. So we, we have these reduced inner diameter wheels that aren't putting pressure on the sides so that the shoe can come through and hold the trench open and then the closing system can close. So we have another question, Joel. Oh, that's a good question. Yep. So if we're looking at a opening disc, uh, how can we tell what thickness we have? So like on this one in particular, this is an original John Deere. This one has no stamp saying what it is. So I can't really speak to, to other manufacturers as to what they have, um, but surely you could use this part number and call your dealership and see how thick it actually is. I'm sure they would have that, have insight into that. Um, but as far as actually being stamped on here, no, they, they usually are not. Was that, is that all the questions for now? Okay. Okay, so we've talked about furrow creation on a case row unit. So I wanna talk about furrow creation a little bit here on a deer or a Kinsey or an Agco. Um, a lot of the, the true V style openers. Uh, I say deer because we've got green paint here, green paint right behind me. It's just easiest to, to reference that, but I, I should be a little bit more colorblind, I know. So when we're talking about a true V style opening system, we've got two disc openers that are coming across the field and they have that contact point that we already measured and, and adjusted our shimming. And these are what's creating the trench. Now, as these go across the field, we need a way to keep that trench open to make sure that it's not falling back in and letting dry soil fall in on top of our seed. And you know now we don't have moisture right there. So we use our gauge wheels. And what these gauge wheels do, if we step over here, we can see it a little bit better. But if we step over here, these gauge wheels are right up against our disc opener. And that's gonna put pressure on this dirt right underneath here. And that's what's actually gonna hold that trench open. Now, we need to be careful that we don't compact the sidewall as we're doing this. So when we have some sort of a, of a downforce management system, whether that's hydraulic or air, um, or even something as simple as load pins um, with springs, we, have, we now have visibility into seeing how much weight we're actually carrying on those gauge wheels. And what we can do with that knowledge is make a, make a management decision on how much downforce we're gonna apply to manage that compaction. So how do we check for compaction in the sidewall? When we make a pass across the field, we wanna tie our closing system up. Then we wanna go and make a pass, and then we're gonna get a, a, our seat digger or our pocket knife out, and we wanna go back through and pick the side of those, those sidewalls apart and see how easily does that break apart. So if you're into a soil where you're really digging into that and it's kinda of coming off in big chunks and really just you know, big, big uh, blocky kind of stuff. If that comes off in big chunks like that, you're probably carrying a little bit too much weight. On the inverse of that, if you have your closing system tied up and you make a pass across the field and you go back and that trench is always already closed, already fallen in on itself, we should probably talk about carrying a little bit more weight here because what we're actually gonna have is that dry soil falling down into the seed trench and now we can have issues with, with depth as that, as that dirt is falling in. If the seed bounces or anything like that, we can have issues with depth. Uh, we're also gonna have emergence problems because we're not getting into moisture now with all those dry clods falling in. Another thing to think about whenever the trench is falling in is we can have bigger clods falling in off the top and now we've got air pockets to deal with too. So a lot of issues that can come with, uh, with not having good furrow creation practices. Um, trying to look through my notes here. 
One thing I did forget to mention on disc openers was a case row unit should be an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch of a gap between their discs. So we don't actually want those with, we actually don't want those touching. We actually want a gap between those two. But I just wanted to touch on that quick uh, to, to get myself back on track here. So how can we, how can we do a, a first day in the field test? Well, we already talked about, we're not in a race. We're not trying to, to set any records here. We want to go out and we just want to do things right. You know, grandpa always told us, if you're not going to do it right, don't do it at all. So that's what we're going to do. So we talked about holding up our closing system. We've got this, this nifty tool we came out with a little while ago. A, a ratchet strap will work. There's a million different options for that. But tying that closing system up and seeing um, how, how good of a job are we actually doing? This is, this is critical stuff here. So um, I, I got to go over here. I'm, I didn't wear my glasses or my contacts today, so I got to get a little bit closer to my notes. You guys will have to forgive me a little bit. Um, when we're talking about no-till, for you guys specifically, how much weight should I carry on my gauge wheels? Couldn't tell you. This is a management decision based on what you're seeing on your farm. As no-tillers, you can probably carry a little bit less weight on your gauge wheels um, because you don't need the, the firming action to hold the sidewall open as much, but you're probably going to have to to put more downforce on to actually get into the ground. So it's a, it's a two-way street there, um, and it's kind of a contradicting statement because I just told you you don't have to carry as much, but you need to carry more to get into the ground. So it's a two-way street there. And as far as a case row unit, you guys can actually carry uh, a little, or you guys will carry a little bit more um, historically just from what we've seen. So what is the the number one thing in, in a true v opener as far as actually forming that trench so we've got our disc openers got our gauge wheels um we need a seed tube guard so what does the seed tube guard do well it guards the seed tube but it also holds those disc openers out and holds those open so we can create a, a nice open v trench so what i'll show you what i'm talking about here so if we have a seed tube guard that's worn this is probably what our trench looks like the ground is going to put pressure against the sides of those disc openers and if that seed tube guard has worn it's actually going to squish that furrow together Whereas if we've got uh, a full size seed tube guard, it's gonna be able to hold this trench wider and we can actually get seed to the bottom of the trench. So why do we care about this? When we drop the seed down in, the, down in this trench, in this smaller one, it's gonna get stuck somewhere up in there or could get stuck somewhere up in there. But with a nice V trench, our seed is actually getting the depth and actually getting into moisture. Now, you're going to say, well, Clay, that's great, but I've got Keaton's. A Keaton will not fix planter maintenance issues. So in this case, you see we've got this little, little air pocket in the bottom. A Keaton can firm that seed into the bottom and take that air pocket out. But in a lot of cases, if the trench is just built too small from top to bottom, a Keaton can't force that seed all the way down and fix your planter maintenance issues. So that's one thing that I really want you to think about. And another thing that you can do this winter is do an open furrow trial if you've got time. Change out one seed tube guard, put one new one on and run it right beside a worn one. Go out to the field. If, if you're thawed out enough that you can do a little, bit of, a little bit of trials, see what it's actually looking like you can see how that furrow is actually formed differently um, when the seed tube guard is worn. So I really wanna, really wanna encourage you guys to try that. Or if you're a last minute guy like myself, do it the first of May. It'll, it'll make for an interesting spring. But especially in no-till conditions, you guys always are gonna wanna be doing seed tube guards with every set of discs. Um, these heavy no-till conditions, 
in all reality, you're actually probably wearing out a seed tube guard before the discs are worn out. I understand it's, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge to justify taking all that apart and then put used disc openers back on, but a new seed tube guard. So we really want to encourage you guys to do seed tube guard with every set of disc openers. Um, so any questions, Joel? Still good? Awesome. All right. So we talked about depth. We talked about how our furrow is created and how all these parts work together to create a furrow and how depth can affect emergence. So I want to go through a, a block test with you. And this is something, again, that you can do right now. That's really what I'm targeting. I want you guys to be able to have actionable items right now. Because if this goes three months, chances are you're probably not going to do it. So I want you guys to have actionable items right now that you guys can leave this meeting and go out and take care of. So when we're doing a block test, we want to get some four by four blocks and we want to go out and set four by four blocks under these gauge wheels and set the planter down. So the key to this test is actually making sure that the disc openers are not touching the ground. That's absolutely critical. So we want the disc openers hanging in the air, gauge wheels supported, and set your depth to two inches. Now, I forgot one step in this. Before you put your four by four blocks under there, mark a line at say two inches, two and a quarter, and two and a half on the side of those four by fours. And put that side with writing to the inside here so that the disc openers hang right beside that line. So you can see how far your disc openers are actually going. Set this to two inches. And what you'll see is you will see variability across the entire planter. Even on a brand new planter, you will see variability row to row, just imperfections in the casting, in the tires, in the gauge wheel arms. There's, there's imperfections. This is all man-made stuff. But that's okay. We can go through and we can change our depth based on these dots, right? So this is where you need to have a paint pen. So you do your block test on this row. You set to two and a half inches. And let's say it's over. Okay, you're over depth, so you adjust your T-handle, go shallower one notch. Okay, now we're at two inches. So what I want you to do, I want you to take your paint pen, and I want you to mark here and here. And then on the side, that's two. So now we know, okay, this is two inches. And it's not going to be the same spot all the way across the planter. But as long as we know where our actual planting depth is, that's totally okay. So we've adjusted for where in these systems. Now let's actually look at what these, what these systems wear like. So I'm trying to think of the easiest one. Let's just go over to this gauge wheel here. So this is a brand new gauge wheel arm. So we've got the, uh, the threaded adjustment bushing here so we can adjust the shimming of the gauge wheel in and out, right? So how does this actually work? So when this is on the planner, the mustache comes up and it rides right here. And that mustache is attached to the depth handle. So we've got a lot of wear points here. We've got the bolt that goes through the T handle that holds the mustache on the mustache, mustache itself, we can get wear here on the gauge wheel arm. We can get wear in this bushing, especially because inherently it's a threaded part. There's got to be slop so we can get it together. So all that's going to do is accelerate. As this wears more, um, the wear pattern is just going to you know, increase exponentially. So these are all items that we need to be looking at. Um, and and like, I, like we said, we can adjust for some of these issues, right? When we do the block test, we can see if there's issues. However, if you have a lot of wear in this bushing here, that's gonna let this gauge wheel pull away from the disc openers and allow dry clods to get back in there. So let's go over here to this row and I'll show you what that looks like. So Micah, if you wanna come around the front here, you, can, you should be able to see that fairly well. So, if we pick our gauge wheels up to planting depth, and this is important to have these at planting depth 
when we're shimming these, okay? So we need to make sure that we can't get our fingers behind here. This is not good. We want the backside of this tire to be lightly scrubbing this disc opener because what will happen is we can get dry clods of dirt packed in behind there and then they're going to fall into our trench, cause those air pockets, have dry soil in the trench, it's going to lead to emergence issues. So how can we fix it? We'll loosen this, loosen this bolt up back here and we can adjust this threaded bushing in or out and we can tighten that gauge wheel up against the disc openers. However, in this case, this one is just entirely too worn. We need to replace this gauge wheel arm um, and, and then we can, we can adjust the shimming from there. So another question that always comes up is spoke gauge wheels. If you have this gauge wheel shim tight to the disc openers, you shouldn't need a spoked gauge wheel because that mud shouldn't even be able to get in there and pack the backside of these gauge wheels. So that's my stance on spoke gauge wheels. You shouldn't need them if you've got things shimmed correctly. All right. And that's, that's one that I could, I could probably be swayed either way, but that's my opinion. We've all got one. They're like armpits, right? So when we were looking at that gauge wheel tire, remember we saw there was chunks out of that. Now, if we go back over to this new one, we've got a nice smooth rubber edge, a sharp rubber lip around there. And what that's doing is that's riding right up against that, against that disc opener. And so now we can actually clean that, right? That's how, that's how we're getting our sealing. So when I'm, when I'm adjusting gauge wheels, I want them just lightly scrubbing a disc opener. Um, if I pick one up, I don't want it to hang. I, I need that gauge wheel to come up and drop back down. Now, we don't want to like that guy over there where it's so loose that it's falling all over the place, but we just, it's, it's all by feel, really. So, on a Kinsey, when we're talking about depth, depth adjustments and thing, things like that, on a Kinsey, we've got a different system. We've got the socket on the gauge, on the gauge wheel arm, and then we've got what we call the dog bone right so it kind of looks like a dog bone that's how it's how it got its name so we need to check and make sure that, that dog bone and socket have a nice mesh to each other um, if they're super sloppy and they're flopping all over the place um, we need to we need to talk about things like that and, and replacing those there's also right down the center where the where the linkage adjusts on a kinsey we need to look at that um, i've seen kinsey planters that actually on that socket it's worn all the way through so we need to keep a good eye on those because it's not as visible as a, as a deer or an agco or something like that, where it's just like, oh, you walk by and you see it, it's kind of hidden from you. Another thing on Kinsey's and 15-inch and, uh, planters, you know, something like a 1790, if you're using this to plant corn and beans, we need to keep an extra close eye on our corn rows. And the reason for that is we're going to wear them out faster. They're getting used on two crops. So, you know, if you're planting a thousand acres, those, those corn rows are getting all 1,000 acres, whereas the bean rows are only getting 500. So we need to keep an extra close eye on the corn rows, but don't forget about your bean rows because a lot of times we can just say, oh, it's just beans. We kind of gets pushed to the back burner. And then five years down the road, we haven't checked it at all. And it's like, oh my goodness, we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, on, on, a, on a deer gauge wheel arm, we, we can flip those side to side. Now that's one thing that only deer can do. No one else has this same design. And so this is, this is something that specifically a deer row unit can do, but we can take this center bolt out and move that to the other side. So as that wears a groove from the mustache, uh, that's actually gonna start to get into the gauge wheel arm. We can flip that to the other side and then and then we can uh, use that again. So we want to check our our gauge wheels in planting position. Um, if we if we're seeing rooster tails coming off the backside of that gauge wheel as we're going through the field, um, that's probably a sign we're getting dry dirt in there. We need to shim that a little bit tighter. Uh, as far as gauge wheel widths, I'm going to typically recommend a standard gauge wheel. Now, if you're in in a an area that you need that flowability of cover crop cover crops coming through the planter, 
Uh, we need to talk about, you know, maybe snaring those gauge wheels up, going to a narrow gauge wheel, and then we can get a little bit better flowability through there. Um, what time we get? Oh boy, moving right along. Okay, so I kind of hinted to this earlier, and who knows? We'll see how this goes. I want you guys to try taking your no-till colder off. Now, I say that with a couple nuances. If you're running a cast iron shank, give it a shot. If you're running an older style uh, welded steel, a pressed steel shank, you might want to keep it because what that no-till colder is actually doing is that's protecting the row unit from rocks and it's giving it just a little bit easier life. But if you're running a cast shank, I'd, I'd encourage you to give it a shot. Just try it once. Now, when you're running that no-till colder, you have to remember that's the analogy that I like to use. That's like having two shovels you have to put in the ground. Now you guys can look at me. I struggle to get a shovel in the ground as it is. So two shovels definitely isn't happening. But imagine having two shovels, one foot on each one. That's what having that colder is like. So if you can put both feet on one, you can probably run a little bit less downforce. And if you're getting some sidewall compaction, because you have to run so much downforce, you can get rid of a little bit of that. Now, the other, the other uh, thing with a no-till colder is you can hairpin residue really easily. If that colder is pulling residue down into the trench and pinning it at the bottom, you can run into some issues there. And it's something I want you guys to make sure that you get out and dig and make sure that you're not hairpinning residue. So, I'll end that with some people need a no-till colder, but I encourage you to try running without. It's a, it's a good experiment. That first day in the field, you can say, hey, that guy from precision planning was wrong. We're gonna go put that thing back on. And that's okay, maybe you do need it. So I wanna touch on row cleaners really quick. Um, as far as a row cleaner goes, I much prefer a floating row cleaner like this. Um, I really am really am not a fan of a pinned row cleaner. Now, something floating like this, uh, generally, we're going to see like something like a clean, clean sweep or a Yetter Air Address or something like that. Um, and that's kind of kind of our recommendation is to have something like that so you can manage how much you're lifting or lowering or how much downforce you're putting uh, on those row cleaners. Now, there's a lot of different designs. We can run uh, a wider treader like this one or we can run the little inch and a half one we can run these these tine style or we can run a more aggressive like a uh, like a shark tooth style row cleaner uh, for most scenarios for most growers a tine row cleaner is is going to be okay um, if you've got heavy residue um, like you know a lot of corn stubble that you're trying to push out of the way real thick stuff um, you might want to think about going to a shark tooth to be able to move that residue out of the way. Now, my, my word of caution with a shark tooth row cleaner is it can get way too aggressive very fast. Um, a shark tooth is meant to move a lot of material. So if there's not a lot of material, it's going to be moving a lot of dirt. So that's where things like, you know, having, having some downforce management on your row cleaner and having those depth bands can really be really be beneficial. Well, it looks like we got a question from, from Joel back here. It's worth trying. Yep. So the scenario, and I, I, don't, I don't remember every detail of it, but it sounded like a, a no-tilling into beans scenario. Um, do I still recommend pulling the no-till cooler off? I still recommend you try it. Um, no row cleaner, I'm not as keen on, you know, if you're running a, a row cleaner, I'd say, oh, absolutely go for it. Um, I still recommend trying it though. There's not, I mean, it's, it's a four bolts to try it. Um, that first day in the field, it's 15 minutes, take it off 15 minutes, put it back on. I've probably wasted a half hour in a lot worse ways in terms of management decisions on, on a farm. So it's, that would be my recommendation. Now I want to touch on closing quick before we, before we run totally out of time here. So standard closing system, we've got uh, bushings up here in the front, and then we've got our closing wheels. So then we've got our, well, actually let's go to a row that actually has it. So then we've got our downforce uh, spring and T handle here. So in most 
scenarios, I'm going to recommend running your wheels in a staggered pattern. Uh, it, it just pinches that trench together a little bit better. Um, as far as what wheels are actually on there, most guys are going to see uh, a yield response from something like, you know, in, in a no-till situation, something like a, a spiked style and, and a, a heavy cast on the other side. Um, I, I have seen, seen some data that, that supports that. Now, it's worth while you're going through this stuff in the winter, when the planter is set down on the ground, grab the bathroom scale. And in the first notch, see how much weight's on there and go through each one and see how much weight you're actually carrying in those positions. Because again, you're going to see row to row variability in each one of those areas. So it's worth just writing down to see what it is. And then you can make management decisions of what notch you're going to run in based off of that. So the other thing we need to check as far as closing wheels is make sure that the bearings in the wheel are actually tight and they're not flopping back and forth. And also these bushings. So make sure that we can't move this, move this back and forth like that. Now, on our first day in the field, I want to encourage you to set the planter down on some sort of concrete or blacktop or something like that and pull it forward three feet, four feet, and you'll actually find that the disc openers will scratch a line in that blacktop, and you want the, the center line of that row, which is the disc openers creating the scratch, you want that to be right down the center of this closing tail. So you can use those eccentric bushings in the closing tail to straighten that up. Um, so as far as actually setting down for us on a closing system, we want to make sure that we're closing the trench. We want to make it look like we were never there, right? So we want to make sure we're closing the trench, sealing it off, make sure that we're managing moisture if we need to be, but we don't want to compact that. And there's something that we talk about a lot in product support. When we get, you know, we get a phone call in, Hey, my planner quit running or whatever. Did you dig? I want to encourage you guys to dig. That's the only way you're going to know what kind of a job you're doing here is if you dig. Same thing with downforce on the gauge wheels. I can't give you that number. You need to go out and dig. So it's incredibly important. That first day we're out there, just get out, do some digging, see how things are doing. Now, as we go deeper in terms of planting depth, we need to widen these wheels out. So we can, so if you think about these closing wheels, they're gonna create a line that comes down and you want that line to be right at the seed. So as we go deeper, we need to move our wheels out farther so we can get more pressure down deeper. Um, not a huge deal on, you know, something like an inch and a half to two inch planting depth if you're moving something like that. Now, if you're going a half inch on sugar beets and two inches on corn or two and a half on, on you know, late beans, you should probably really think about moving things around. I'd highly encourage you to, to, to move those back and forth if you're making a giant swing like that. Do we have a recommendation on where to start with closing system downforce? As long as you are effectively destroying the trench, that's a good place to start. Um, you wanna make sure that you're, you're collapsing that trench so again, first day in the field, it's not a race. Just take your time. Do, if you wanna do this, you could do one, two, three, four. Cause we got to, we got to stop. We got to check all this stuff out. Set all four different positions and see where you're at. And then you can evaluate all four of them right there live side by side and see how they're doing. So we got a little bit more here for you guys. So again, it's winter time. We haven't even talked about meters yet. So I wanna encourage you to call your local precision planning dealer and talk about getting your meters ran. Um, that's, that's the only way to know uh, how those meters are really performing. Uh, I, I shouldn't say through precision planning, call your, your dealer and have those meters ran. Um, I know Kinsey has their own test stand. They can give you a report of how your meters are actually performing so you can see, hey, I know that this was a management issue on something else of the planner, it wasn't a, a meter issue. Now, I don't think this one is like it, but clean your seed boxes out. So if we leave seed in there, it's gonna attract mice. They're gonna crawl up the seed tube. They're gonna chew through anything they have to get to get to that seed, whether that's meter parts, 
you know, brushes, seed discs, all that stuff, clean those boxes out. Also this winter, um, when we're going over planter maintenance and we have one disc open off, feel up inside the bottom of the seed tube. If there's a burr on the bottom of that seed tube, just take a file and, and knock that off. Now, if you've been running this planter for a while and you haven't changed the seed tube garden, that burr is probably from those disc openers rotating and actually wearing the plastic and it'll actually start to curl up around and that can create a spacing issue because those seeds are gonna be ricocheting off of that potentially. Now, another thing about wintertime planter maintenance, what is the best way to maintenance your chains? You got a chain drive planter, do I put diesel fuel on them? Do I put used oil on them? Do I spray PB blaster on them? The best way to maintain them is to take a pair of bolt cutters to them. Now, the reason being, if those get one tight spot in them, now you've created a spacing issue. Every time that link comes around and it jars something, now you've got a spacing issue. So I really wanna encourage you guys, take a bolt cutter to those chains, cut them off every year and replace them. Now. As far as everything else on a, on a chain drive system, you're gonna have your, your sprockets. You wanna check those and make sure that the teeth aren't worn, there's no bends. You wanna rotate that hex shaft, make sure that it turns freely. Um, the other thing is on a, on a bigger planter, you know, something like a 1770 that has chain drive, make sure that the dogs where those shaft drives meet are lined up. Make sure the shafts are aligned because if those aren't, they could be doing some funky things as that comes around creating more spacing issues. Um, as far as cable drives, really just want to make sure that those cable drives are turning freely, you know, in the, in the little short tube there. And I think we mentioned earlier, but a Keaton seed firmer requires 20 ounces of tension. Um, so you want to use something like a fish scale, loop those around your Keaton. And as soon as those come up off the ground, that's kind of the measurement that we're looking for. So I'll turn it up to, or turn it open to some questions here. And otherwise, I just want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank the no-till farmer. I want to thank you guys as no-till farmers for joining us. And I hope you guys have some, some questions here. Nothing? Awesome. I, I think that says you covered it pretty well, Clayton. So, um, yeah, I want to say thanks to you again. Thanks to Micah, Joel, and the team at Precision Planning for joining us today. And all of you for tuning in as well. Also want to remind you, today's presentation and audio will be made available on the No-Till Farmer website. If you'd like to review what was talked about today or show it to any of your farm crew, neighbors, or anyone else, you'll also receive an email within 48 hours of the recorded presentation. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. On behalf of uh, No-Till Farmer, Precision Planting, thank you all for joining us and feel free to reach out to us and let us know if there are any topics you'd like us to cover in future webinars. Have a great day.